In chapter 15, we're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system. Now recall from our previous discussions of the divisions of the nervous system. We have the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and spinal cord. We have the peripheral nervous system, where, which consists of the cranial and spinal nerves, and also has a sensory division, which detects stimuli both internally and externally and a motor division which responds to stimuli by movements like muscles or secretions are glands. And the motor division has two sub further subdivisions. The somatic nervous system where responses are voluntary and the autonomic nervous system which contain responses that are involuntary and is sometimes referred to as the general visceral motor system. In this chapter, we're going to discuss the components of the autonomic nervous system. And we're going to look at the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches. First, we will start by comparing the characteristics of the somatic nervous system to the autonomic nervous system. Characteristics of the somatic nervous system include effectors or target organs that are our skeletal muscles, efferent pathways and ganglia, which are cell bodies of the motor neuron that are in the central nervous system, and their axons extend in spinal nerves all the way to the skeletal muscles. The somatic nervous system utilizes neurotransmitters like acetylcholine, which is released in the synaptic cleft or neuromuscular junction, where it always excites or stimulates the fibers to contract. And there is myelination. Neurons are highly myelinate, myelinated. Now, the autonomic nervous system, the effectors or target organs are cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. And you will see that the efferent pathways and ganglia, the motor unit of the autonomic nervous system, is a two neuron chain. And we will examine some of the characteristics of the two neuron chain. The cell body of the first neuron, which is known as the preganglionic neuron, resides in the brain or spinal cord. It then has an axon. The preganglionic axon synapses with the second motor neuron, which is called the postganglionic neuron. The axon of the postganglionic neuron extends to the effector organ. Now, the preganglionic neurons, as you will see, always use acetylcholine, but the postganglionic neurons can use acetylcholine or adrenaline. Norepinephrine and epinephrine its effect will vary according to the target tissue. So this can either be stimulatory or inhibitory. And acetylcholine, the effect can again vary according to the target tissue and can be stimulatory or inhibitory. In addition, the amount of myelination varies. The preganglionic neurons are lightly myelinated while the postganglionic neurons are unmyelinated. Now, looking at the divisions of the autonomic nervous system, we have the sympathetic, which is also called the fight or flight, and the parasympathetic, which is known as the rest and digest, or feed and breed. The actions via the autonomic nervous system is by dual innervation. 
In other words, the two divisions counterbalance each other's activities in an attempt to maintain homeostasis. These two divisions are separated on the basis of some characteristics, the origin of their fibers. The sympathetic fibers originate in the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord and are sometimes referred to as thoracolumbar. Parasympathetic fibers originate in the cranial and sacral regions of the spinal cord and are sometimes referred to as craniosacral. The relative lengths of their fibers also varies. Parasympathetic has long preganglionic and short postganglionic fibers. Sympathetic has short preganglionic fibers and long postganglionic fibers. The location of their ganglia. Parasympathetic is located in the visceral effector organ or near it. Sympathetic is located near the spinal cord in a chain of ganglia called the sympathetic trunk. And here are some of those characteristics for the sympathetic division. Remember the sympathetic is also called the fight or flight. Also sometimes by the four E's. Excitement, emergency, embarrassment, exercise. Sympathetic the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine in the first synapse, but epinephrine or norepinephrine in the second synapse. Here's the chain ganglia for the sympathetic connections. And this shows you the sympathetic innervation with a difference in the preganglionic and the postganglionic fibers. These are the four E's that I mentioned and some of the effects you will see with the sympathetic nervous system like dilating pupils, increasing heart rate, decreasing digestive processes, Sympathetic effects can be seen widespread throughout the body. And the sympathetic effects can also be augmented from the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla is, secretes epinephrine. It can augment or enhance the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. Here is some of the parasympathetic divisions that we discussed previously. Remember it's the craniosacral division. Here is the innervation of the parasympathetic. Again showing you the difference in the preganglionic and postganglionic fibers and some of the effects that can be seen with the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system will have a one at a time effect. You won't see a mass response in the body. And here you can see the connection between the autonomic fibers and target effectors is different than the typical synapse as you examined with the neuromuscular junction. The neurotransmitter is released from swellings along the side of the fiber. Here you can see the difference in somatic versus visceral reflexes. Somatic reflexes involve a direct connection from the ventral horn of the spinal cord to the skeletal muscle. Visceral involves a projection from the central neuron to a ganglion, followed by a second projection 
from the ganglion to the target effector. Here we can see the difference in short versus long reflexes. And an example of autonomic control of pupillary size is demonstrated here. So you can see the effect of activation of the receptor to the output of response. And now we'll look at the makeup of the cholinergic and adrenergic receptors that we just discussed. Again, the cholinergic are named because of drugs that bind to and mimic their response. So you have the nicotinic versus the muscarinic. The nicotinic acting like nicotine and muscarinic acting like toxin from mushrooms. and the adrenergic receptors, alpha and beta, which also have further subtypes shown on the next slide. Alpha and beta work through different types of second messenger systems like cyclic A&P and adenylate cyclase, and some of the effects of the subtypes are shown for each. And this gives you a summary of the cholinergic and adrenergic receptors that we discussed, including the type, location, and effect on binding. And finally, we can examine some of the effects of drugs, like atropine, for example. Atropine is an anticholinergic drug that blocks parasympathetic uh, parasympathetic effects and is routinely administered to prevent salivation, cause pupil dilation, and to dry up respiratory secretions. Another drug, neostigmine, inhibits acetylcholinesterase and therefore acetylcholine can accumulate in the synapse and muscle contraption is impaired. Beta blockers are a class of drugs that inhibit the cardiac system via beta-1 adrenergic receptors. These drugs help to reduce heart rate and arrhythmias without disrupting other sympathetic effects. And ephedrine is a sympathetic mimicking drug that stimulates alpha adrenergic receptors. And you can see some of the different classes of drugs, additional ones that were not mentioned, and their effects and examples along with clinical use in the body.